Tafi of Fat Malam, my love, feel let to. Ya ta ye say I knew le I na O to a full law la to te au my ma i ma malai sambo Amalo I fear malo This is the prayer to Tangalo the ancient god of the Samoans This particular prayer was used to ward off strangers Drive away from us the sailing gods, lest they come and cause disease and death. The first population estimate in Samoa was made 71 years after Captain Bougainville sent a party ashore because of sickness. 35 years after that census, 40% of the population was gone. This is the other for you, O sailing gods. Do not come ashore at this place but be pleased to depart along the ocean to some other land. The people of New Way had a more practical method of warding off strangers. When Captain Cook's ships arrived at New Way, they beheld a fearsome sight, angry natives, spears in hand, shouting their wrath at the trespassers. But more horrifying, was the blood-stained teeth dripping with flesh just eaten. In fact, it was the red flesh of the hula hula banana which stained the teeth blood red and gave a most gruesome countenance. Very useful on such occasions. Captain Cook didn't bother to dock. He named New Way Savage Islands and moved on. But for the people of New Way, it was a successful day at the wharf. Strangers were not welcome there. They had brought sickness and fear. Captain Cook was reputed to be a considerate captain who was mindful of the welfare of his crew. But when the Hawaiians rowed out to meet the Endeavour after it arrived from Tahiti, its crew were so ravaged with disease that there were hardly enough of them to work the deck. But for Professor Kekuni Blaisdell of Hawaii, Cook's visit marked a turning point in the nation's history. Captain Cook's crewman introduced the devastating venereal diseases, gonorrhea, the clap, and the syphilis, the pox. Probably also tuberculosis, because two of Cook's men are known to have tuberculosis and died of what was called consumption at that time. So it's very likely that that the white plague, tuberculosis, was introduced. Cook stopped at various points in the Hawaiian Islands to provision the ship and heal the sick. The crew took part of a heiau, a sacred place of worship, and converted it into a hospital. The population of Hawaii was recently estimated to have been around one million. And those sailing with Cook described the Hawaiians as strong and well-made, upon the whole a fine and handsome set of people whose abundant stock of children promised a good supply for the next generation. The Hawaiians enjoyed a high standard of living. In fact, Cook's crew was overwhelmed by the abundance and variety of foodstuffs offered them. All easily obtained from the massive gardens that stretched even into the mountainous regions, and the numerous fish farms which dotted the island's coastline. So about the time of the arrival of the missionaries in 1820, which of course was 40 or so years after the coming of Captain Cook, the population was down to estimated 150,000. By the time of the United States armed invasion and takeover of our country in 1893, there were only 40,000 of us left, and at that time we were outnumbered by 50,000 foreigners at that time. So, if you look at those figures, it means that over 90, there's been over 95% eradication of our people. So that's a holocaust, by any definition. Captain Cook named the Kingdom of Tonga the Friendly Islands. And this etching depicts a grand feast for Cook and his crew. The Tongans were friendly.
friendly, right up to the time that they planned to kill him. Captain Cook, however, moved on before the deed could be carried out, but he left his calling card. The Tongans were famous in our region as a strong warrior nation, but the new arrivals brought something they could not fight. Four years later, on Cook's second visit, his surgeon reported syphilis and tuberculosis among the people. These women show the care we normally give to our graves. Our dead are close to us. Yet in one epidemic, a Westerner reported that the carnage was such that we were unable to carry the dead away and bury them. Between 1799 and 1826, about a quarter of the remaining population was destroyed. In half a century, more than 60% of the population of Tonga was wiped out. After Cook, the larger volcanic islands like Hawaii, Samoa and Tahiti became popular ports of call for many a foreign vessel. And our people became exposed to contact with traders and whalers who brought with them material goods, adventure and exploitation. But their effects on us pale into insignificance when compared to a devastating new trade that invaded the Pacific in the 19th century. In 1863, a ship was approaching the tiny island of Mukulaila in Tuvalu. The people were excited as the ship they were expecting was to have on board a missionary who would teach them about Christianity. That ship would have received a welcome similar to this one for our arrival. But the ship that came in had no missionary. It was a slave ship, equipped with guns and iron gratings to kidnap the islanders for the guano mines of Peru. Slave traders told the people that after six months on a neighboring island making coconut oil, they would be returned with their Christian teachers. The ruse worked. The people flocked to the ship, some still clutching their most precious possession, pages from the New Testament. Kemese Sinoma reads from the book so highly prized by his ancestors. He is an elder of the village and recalls that time with the familiarity of a people who cannot forget. I heard that they were big ships and that they anchored out in the ocean. And the Palangi told the people to come up to the boat so they could do the fatele dancing in exchange for the food. The people were so happy and they got into those boats. When they arrived on the ships, they were taken down below deck, but they weren't given any food. The boat had left the island without them realizing it. Seventy-nine percent of the people of Mukulailai were taken. They said that most of the people that were left behind were very sad. Most of those who were stolen were men, so the women and the children who were left behind were so sad. These people are from the generation following the raid on Nukulailai. They were, like many, who all over the Pacific grew up without fathers, for the slave ships targeted the smaller islands, whose remoteness left them vulnerable. The kidnapped inhabitants were unloaded here, at the main Peruvian port of Calao, from where they never returned. The Moai, the great stone statues of Easter Island, speak silently of a civilization dedicated to craftsmanship and the honor of ancestors. They face inland, offering security to their descendants in this, the most isolated inhabited spot in the world. But the Moai could do nothing to shelter their people when the isolation was broken and the slave trade took hold. 
These people are the descendants of the few who were left behind after the slavers had mounted raid upon raid on Rapa Nui. Between 1862 and 1863, 40 ships arrived at the island. Archaeologist Edmundo Edwards visits the bay where the slavers landed. They started showing uh, trinkets and glass beads, and mirrors, and then they said, come to the ships, come with us to make signs, and once you arrive to the ships, we'll give you more things. So the people started getting inside boats, and this way they were taken off to the ships, and uh, then they came back, but there were several islanders who didn't want to go. And as they wouldn't leave, then they started obliging them and grabbing them and put them on into the boats. Then some other people hid in a little cave, and it's a tiny little hole, and there were four islanders inside the cave, and as they wouldn't come out of the cave, then the captain of one of the ships, he went there and shot those who were inside the cave. And at that time, uh, the group of warriors had arrived here with the king. The king used to live in Anakina, and uh, Kaimakoi, uh, the king, uh, he was standing, uh, everybody says, on this rocks here with a group of warriors, and then he saw that the people were being kidnapped, and he asked, where is my son? And they said, your son, they are taking him in one of the boats over there. So then he jumped into the ocean with all the warriors and they swam out and tried to capsize the boat. But he was hit in the head and they grabbed him and pulled him inside the, the boat. And that's how he was kidnapped with his son and the priest and most of the important people of the island. <laughs> Today, children in Easter Island are attempting to relearn much of their culture, which was lost as a direct result of the slave trade. With their king and elders gone, the people were left without leaders. So there was a tremendous vacuum in the power of the island. All the knowledge was lost. The Rongo Rongo boards that were these tablets that had a hieroglyphic language, uh, nobody could read them anymore. Asian ceremonies disappeared. I mean, the whole thing was a breakdown. There was was a disaster. Like Tokelau and Tuvan, the remaining population was so tiny that the people had to marry out. Though today's Easter Islanders are of mixed descent, to them they are Toto Rapa Nui, Easter Island blood through and through. Pakomio Māori was the last survivor of 15 men repatriated to Easter Island. But here, as in the rest of the Pacific, the tiny number repatriated brought disaster, smallpox and other diseases that further decimated their people. In the years following Cook's arrival, disease caused Tahiti's population to fall 75% in 20 years, and the Marquesas population to drop 90% in 65 years. Rarotonga lost 50% in just 15 years, and 75% in less than 40. Rapa Nui, Easter Island, lost 20% in less than 20 years. And by the end of the 19th century, Rapa Nui's population had fallen by over 98%, all to slavery and disease. In the latter part of the 18th century, the priests of King Pomare of Tahiti knew a sense of foreboding. They had heard that a European ship was on its way with something ominous on board. Three days before it arrived in Tahiti, Tauna warned the king of the coming of the strange boat and put a curse on it. In 1796, the British ship Duff docked here at Venus Point with its passenger load of missionaries sent by the London Missionary Society. The locals tried to sink the ship, but the hull was covered in barnacles so they couldn't pierce it. The people say, all the spirits on the marae of Tahiti wept this day. But who were these newcomers who had come from the misery of industrial Europe? John Williams was the London Missionary Society representative who arrived in Tahiti on the Duff. He would be remembered in the oral tradition of many a Pacific nation. 
The other major influence was the Methodists. Theirs was a no-frills religion, a reaction against the decadence of the High Anglican Church. Their mission was to ease the burden of the working classes. Between them and the London Missionary Society, they evangelized a good part of our region. At the heart of their theology was a strong commitment to the work ethic and the notion of original sin. For us, such notions could not be taken seriously. Our children were gifts from the gods, not sins that needed cleansing. The missionaries needed a lot more than theology to get our attention, and they knew it. What they did have in their favour was the state our people were in. Ravaged by disease and exposed to a new world, the Pacific was already in a state of flux. Many of us were undergoing power struggles of our own. Some had begun before the missionaries arrived, others started because of them. This turmoil gave them the edge they needed. At first, people were attracted by the newcomers' new technology and material possessions. They were used in many ways because the people wanted their axes and guns and things, instruments that uh, helped so-called material progress. Those of our leaders who chose the new religion would benefit not only from the material support of the missionaries, but from the links with the governments they represented. In Tonga, the missionaries arrived at a time when the people were afraid of being colonized. Britain, France, Germany were looking for colonies in the Pacific. And at the same time, there was civil wars, struggle between the chiefs as when the power of the sacred king to Itong was waning very much. So who was going to be the, the chief for these different islands? Because they were all divided. And one man had the foresight to think that if the, the country was not united, it would be colonized. So there was a great uh, incentive for him to try to win the wars. That man was King Taufa Ahau Tupo I, known as the founder of modern Tonga, and the story of how he was persuaded to accept the new religion is a popular one. Yes, the story is well known how he threw overboard one of his men in a shark infested area to, to prove whether the, the Christian God will save him. And of course the man was a good swimmer, so whether he was saved by being a, a swimmer or the Lord saved him is another question. But that uh, somehow influenced the king. But there are many occasions when the, uh, the old gods' power were tested, exposing and ridiculing the statutes or the carvings of the gods, and they were not struck dead immediately. So they began to, to question the powers of the old gods. The Reverend Shirley Baker, standing in the centre, was instrumental not only in saving the king's soul, but also in assisting to Paul I in drafting a constitution for Tonga. He was helped very much by the missionaries because they brought in education, Christian faith, and many enlightening principles of morality which helped him. And then sometimes when you read history, you wonder who was using who, eh? because he saw the advantage of uh, allying himself with the missionaries, and the missionaries also saw that they could <laughs> change Tonga through this man. of convenience between chiefs keen to use the goods of the missionary to gain power and the missionary's greed for souls was to occur all over the Pacific. Behind me is the monument to John Williams, the first missionary to arrive here in Western Samoa. He was lucky enough not to have to vie for the approval of chiefs because he was accepted by the High Chief Mali Etoa here in the village of Sapapali'i. Mali Etor believed the missionaries to be the fulfillment of a prophecy by our goddess of war, Nafanua. When Mali Etor had approached Nafanua for his share of the power of Samoa, she told him that his power would come from the heavens. When the London Missionary Society arrived here at Mali Etor's village, 
The people believed it was the fulfillment of Nafanua's prophecy. But even here, we didn't embrace Christianity in the spirit that the missionaries had hoped. John Williams wrote that the Samoans approached the new religion for the most materialistic of reasons. <laughs> Our ways were in sharp contrast to the European. Our women, for example, we considered equal to our men. When John Williams arrived, he was sent a delegation of highborn women to welcome him. He was outraged. Women were not accorded the same status as men in European society, so he saw this delegation as an insult. People from a society where even table legs were clothed, our state of undress was high on the hit list in their efforts to evangelize through civilization. After all, no one could enter the pearly gates in such a raw state of nature. We, on the other hand, were disturbed by the rigidity of the missionaries' attitudes and, as John Williams documents, we constantly entreated them to join us in our enjoyment of life. John Williams writes, They are continually wishing the teacher's wives to lay aside their garments and fa'asa more, do as the Samoan ladies do. Gird a shaggy mat around their loins, anoint themselves beautifully with scented oil, tinge themselves with turmeric, put a string of blue beads around their neck, and then, for alia lia, walk about to show themselves. <coughs> Our dancers left them frothing at the mouth. In their eyes, they were earthy, sensuous, and devilish. The drum dance was far too lascivious. Something had to be done, and today's dancers show the change. The garments, which once draped the hips, were raised to waist level, and the women were to cover their breasts. In Hawaii, the hula that was a tribute to Bele, goddess of volcanoes, was banished, they hoped, forever. Even European pantaloons were considered more acceptable than the traditional garb. The mu'umu'u of Hawaii originated with the missionaries. This big shapeless garment was perfect for hiding all the sins of the flesh. We all adopted it, and to this day it's considered a traditional dress of the Pacific. But if the new morality was slow to gain favor with our people, the missionaries had one other powerful tool. From young to old, we all wanted to read and write. Five months after the missionaries began teaching writing in Tonga, the people completely exhausted their stock of Tongan literature and began learning English of their own. In Samoa, the people were so keen to learn this new skill that by the turn of the century, the country was estimated to have a 99% literacy rate. In Aotearoa, where the missionary Samuel Marsden had complained that the natives were not interested in Christianity, they only attend to learn how to read and write, the Māori attained a literacy rate far higher than the people of the missionaries' own countries. Literacy was a skill which we were keen to acquire so that we could fully benefit from the modern world. But it was also one that we would rely on heavily in time to save much of that which would also be lost. This is a copy of the Kumulipo, one version of the Hawaiian creation chant complete with genealogies. 
It is over 2,000 lines long and just a small example of the kind of information that could be recited verbatim should the occasion require it. So why is it recorded in writing? King Kalakaua feared the overwhelming tide of Europeans washed up on their shores would eventually destroy the ancestral gifts held by his people for so many centuries. He ordered his priests and sages to record as much material as possible for the future generations of Hawaiians. That is how the Kumulipo came to be recorded. One of the truly horrible things about contact with foreigners in general for Hawaiians had been the incredible die-off rate uh, right after contact. We know that, we know that Cook introduced um, tuberculosis. We know that he allowed venereal disease um, to, to gain a foothold in the islands. We know that it was responsible for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of deaths, that those diseases and other diseases brought by the uh, Europeans. What a lot of people don't realize is the tremendous impact it had on Hawaiian knowledge. Since the holders of knowledge are generally the elders, you know, the kupuna and the makua, and since these were the ones that were dying, I mean, the elderly, the infirm, they went first. Many times without being able to pass on their knowledge, but even when they did pass on their knowledge, they were passing it off in a context of who knew who would survive, right? You could call in Keone and give him the, the genealogies, you can give him the knowledge, but Keone might be dead in six months himself, right? So within this context, basically what you have is, is, is an incredible loss of, of knowledge, okay? Nevertheless, and I think that's what's really interesting, nevertheless, the, the missionaries come Missionaries come in 1820, you know, people are still dying, and what they try to do is try to preserve as much knowledge as was left. So they send, you know, they send their, their young Hawaiian students out into the community. By the 1830s, they're doing that. They're collecting mo'olelo, they're collecting stories and genealogies, moku'o, moku'auhau, mo'oku'auhau. And then, you know, and then the horrible thing is that then some of these missionaries will take these stories and then distort them, you know, in order to fit a, a Christian message, you know, a message of hope. These people lived in darkness, here comes the light, and now things will be, will, will be better. And so what they didn't want to see was really a glorious past. And so the books are not written with a really glorious past, they are written uh, to suit the missionary purposes. May peace prevail on earth. Despite the intense destruction brought to them by their first contact with the slave traders, Nukulai Lai welcomed those other newcomers, the missionaries, and became the first island in Tuvalu to accept Christianity. Today, they practice it with complete devotion. The church is the center of the village, and each day, their belief is observed in prayer and song. It's difficult for us to enter the minds of our ancestors and understand exactly why Christianity had such appeal for them. Material goods and literacy were strong attractions, as well as the promise of redemption for all. But some of the answer must lie in the way our own religious beliefs imbued every part of our world. Religion was so totally integrated into our lives that we had no separate word for it, but for a people descended from the gods, the concept was not a new one. And to a people who were sacred, what greater gift could you give to your god than yourself? The idea of sacrifice was common throughout the Pacific. A missionary in Tonga wrote that he couldn't understand why those being sacrificed were smiling and regarded it as an honor. Even many of us share that missionary's bemusement. This is the area where the people of Nukulailai would come to pay tribute to their god Tuvalu, who is half human and half spirit. As with many of our people today, such places hold a certain mystery and sometimes even fear. The purpose of those stones was for the performance of sacrifice. 
the people came to worship the god the Tevan. The Ariki would stand like we are now and put the child that has to be sacrificed on one of the stones on this side. And at other times, those stones would be used for the sacrifice of other children. When I got to this area, it made me think back to my ancestors and all the people that lived during those difficult times. Personally, I felt a strong feeling about what it would be like being killed and sacrificed during those worshipping times of the past. Christianity has its own images of service and sacrifice the bread and the wine of communion, symbols of the blood and the body of Christ. In fact, Christianity held many concepts that were already familiar to us. Here at the Afareyatu church on the island of Morea, the Reverend believes that the new God from across the sea was close to their own supreme being. When the missionaries arrived, the people would say, Oh, a new God has arrived, a God of compassion. So they organized a new religious life with ideas from the missionaries. When we are looking for our God, he was just one and he was also a god of compassion. Why? Because he made everything for the people. He created the singing and all the animals and the land with all the good things and land for the people. So our god is also a god of compassion. Our children are called god Ta'aroa. The missionaries called god Yehovah. And for the clergyman, we can realize that there are not two gods, but just one and the same. The mission is built on many beliefs already held. In Samoa, it appropriated the imagery associated with our god Tangaloa's festival of new beginnings. The rising of Palolo in our lagoons ushers in a new season, the rainy season. Our people believed it was Tangaloa's sign of renewal. So we would wear white tapa to symbolize rebirth and garlands of the new season's blooms. To undermine Tangaloa's festival of new beginnings, and thus the belief in Tanga law, the missionaries introduced White Sunday to be held around the same time of the year. It's a service especially for children, where the whole congregation wear white, and there's hardly a family in Samoa that does not take part. The missionaries knew what they were doing, but what they may not have counted on was the cultural stamp which our people give to all things introduced. This is the Methodist Church of our peer, a far cry from its Dua counterpart in its country of origin. There is the same sense of festivity as with the Palolo Rising and Tangalo's Festival of New Beginnings. After all, devotion to religious belief is nothing new to us.
This is the funeral of the great Ngati Paro leader, Sir Apidan Ngata. Many of those here have now passed on, but they left us with a legacy of custom. The Tangi became one of the last bastions of Māori values as Māori language and culture became increasingly under siege by the dominant white society. But even this stronghold of spirituality was modified by the effects of Christianity. Christianity and the churches have actually altered the manner in which the Tangi takes place. Now, prior to the coming of the Pākehā, I say in my own tribal area in Ngāti Pro, in Rangitugia especially, when a person died, what they did was they took the body to a different place altogether. And there they took out the heart, removed the head, and those were buried separately from the, from the flesh and from the bones. Uh, the bodies were left to dry in the sun. The birds came and consumed the flesh. And then the tohunga tupapaku would come, collect up the bones, take those to the marae, and they wept over the bones. That was the practice. Because Christianity came along and said, this is most unhygienic, uh, very unhealthy. You should not do these things. You know, children should not be allowed to see these sorts of things. And of course, um, a lot of the stuff was, how shall I put it, whitened. Or if you like, they called it christened or christened. In actual fact, it was whitened in the ceremony changes. You get the body now lying just for the three days. Because the three days recalls the idea that Christ died on the first day and rose again on the third day. The Māoris have incorporated that idea into the tangi. We survived the disease and the Peruvian slave trade, and we probably could have survived the missionaries. The trouble is, each wave was more devastating than the last, and the missionaries opened the door to the final wave from the West, the colonialists. These are the ambassadors to Samoa from the United States, Britain and Germany. In 1889, their nations partitioned Samoa under the Berlin Treaty. The United States took Eastern Samoa, and Germany gave Britain the Solomons in exchange for Western Samoa. But during the First World War, New Zealand seized Western Samoa on behalf of Great Britain. After the war, New Zealand was granted trusteeship of Western Samoa by the League of Nations. But in 1918, the New Zealand administration made an error of judgment which was to prove fatal for Samoa. That year, the ship Talune docked in Apia carrying the Spanish flu. It was not quarantined. Our village, Sapapali'i, was one of the first on the island of Savai to be affected. My grandfather was away in Upolu, and my granduncle Lafu Lafu was in the forest gathering food for the family. Our granduncle Pemani was just a boy at the time, and he and his baby sister were alone with their parents. Our mother saw what was happening, and she herself was suffering from the sickness. She fetched water for both myself and the girl while Laf Laf went inland to get some food for the evening. But after we were given water, something went wrong in that my mother's mind seemed upset. She came and lay outside the house for about two and a half minutes before she died. She lay outside in the sun up to 4 p.m. before Laf Laf arrived from inland. He went to attend to our mother. He then went to our next door neighbor and came back with our sange and taifel. They picked up our mother and placed a bed sheet on her. My father too was sick and died shortly after. In the house where we were, people were all over the place. It was so difficult. I was lying this way, another person lay this way, two girls in this way. At one corner of the house, there were about 13 people. 
From here to that side, there were seven dead bodies that we didn't know of, not until the grave diggers arrived. In the morning, many of my family died. And likewise, our neighboring families. In the morning, it was not a pleasant sight. People are taken to be buried until the day is over. Western Samoa suffered the greatest recorded loss of life per capita to the worldwide Spanish flu epidemic. Our family's tragedy was repeated everywhere in Samoa as no Ainga was spared. Later, when it was discovered that the New Zealand administrator Logan knew about the disease on board the Talune, yet did not quarantine it, and worse still, refused medical assistance from American Samoa, the anger of our people ran as deep as our grief. The ineptitude of the New Zealand administration's handling of the epidemic became the catalyst in the fight for independence. It gave the Mau, a passive resistance movement, the impetus it needed to rally support against the colonialists. The Mau was banned as seditious, and its leader, Tupua Tamasese, one of Samoa's Tamainga, or paramount chief, was exiled to New Zealand and imprisoned. When he returned from exile, Tupua led a peaceful Mau march along Beach Road in Apia. A scuffle broke out between some of the marchers and the New Zealand police. The New Zealand police opened fire from a machine gun mounted on the roof of this building, the police barracks. On the 5th of September 1929, 11 men died of their wounds, among them Tupua Tamasese. The nation mourned. As a Tamainga, or paramount chief, he represented one of the four ruling titles which unite Samoa as a nation. The people were ready for a fight, but the pacifist philosophy of the Mau was reinforced through Tamasese's dying words. My blood has been spilt for Samoa. I am proud to give it. Do not dream of avenging it, as it was spilt in maintaining peace. The Mavaenga, chief's dying wish, was not broken. In 1962, Western Samoa became the first Pacific nation to gain political independence. Western Samoa was not alone in her struggle for independence. For many of our nations, the call for sovereignty continues today. For Polynesians, the sails of the Papaalangi pierced the womb of the horizon, ending our certainties and leading to our bloody entry to the world. broadcasting fee so you can see more of New Zealand on air.